Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today at an institution that Grant himself attended, and I shall be focusing somewhat on aspects of Grant's work, apart from the very well-known contributions he made to epidemiology, uh, sorry, to, um, to demography, I meant to say, and uh, to statistics. Uh, Grant was useful to us because of his knowledge as a Londoner, and some of the observations he makes on conditions in the city will form uh, the starting point for speculations based on more empirical evidence that I shall go into in this talk. So I've said uh, that Grant was himself a Londoner. We've heard that migrants were a very important uh, sector of the city. Grant lived all his life in London, but actually his father was a migrant, so he wasn't too far removed from this system of people flooding into London. Um, when I say that he'd experienced a trio of tragedies before he published his observations, if you look in the parish register of his home parish of St Michael Corn Hill in the centre of London, you find that his father, Henry Grant, that migrant who had come from uh, the home counties, died on March the 24th, 1661 to 2, that's the old style date. His mother, Mary Grant, died a few uh, months later, and a daughter of his also died in September, just a few months before he wrote the dedicatory epistle, which is attached to his observation on the bills of mortality. So we can see from this that he must have had personal experience of how death was recorded in London, how the mechanisms worked that underpinned the bills of mortality which he studied. And we shall be considering the remarks he made, particularly on the meaning of causes of death in the rest of this paper, where he made some useful insights into the ages uh, that certain causes of death might encompass, and also what the underlying conditions or health problems may have been uh, concerning some of those causes. I shall take in particular three case studies. The first on rickets, the second on teeth, so if nothing else, by the end of this talk, I hope you'll know what teeth mean when you encounter it in the documents in the cabinet over there, and, and the third on old age. Now, the bills of mortality were compiled essentially based on the work of parish officers who also took and kept the parish burial register of the hundred and odd parishes of London. This diagram visualises Grant's description of how we move from a death, a corpse, um, to an actual part of an entry in the bills of mortality, passing through the hands of several people along the way. The purple coloured boxes, the sexton, the searchers and the parish clerk are the parish officials who are involved in this uh, scheme of recording. The sexton arranged for a grave to be dug. So when uh, Grant's parents died, he was the eldest son, he would have spoken to the sexton and arranged for a grave to be dug and the funeral um, to be organised at the parish church. And the sexton would then have advised the two searchers, who were worthy matrons, two women of the parish, who would visit the corpse to ascertain from what the person died. And then the sextons would report, supposedly at the end of each week, to the parish clerk the totals of the causes of death they'd amassed from all those who died in the parish that week. The parish clerk would take that to the hall of parish clerks, where it would be amalgamated into the overall bill of mortality for that week, which was printed and distributed to subscribers. And eventually those were compiled further into annual bills of mortality, which subscribers also took. You could also buy them on the street in some cases. It's important to realise that this isn't independent, therefore, from the system of parochial registration, that uh, the causes of death were compiled essentially based on the ecclesiastical system for recording um, burials, marriages and baptisms that already existed. I shall be looking at three particular London parishes that exceptionally in their burial register also record the cause of death information and ages for those individuals. It wasn't always double entered in this way. Usually it was simply reported um, to the people who compiled the bills of mortality and not actually written down in the parish registers. As Romola has pointed out, sometimes the sexton's books did record this information, but they survive less frequently than the parish registers. The underlying map here is Roke's 1746 map of the City of London, or one tile of it. 
Um, the three parishes you can see are all in the East End, very close to the Tower of London. If you can see that, I'll try and point to it, uh, just down here. And the city of London, the rest of the city of London, is just off the edge here, sort of extending uh, to the left. That's the city wall up here. So these parishes are just outside the city to the east. Um, I shall also refer at times to Grant's home parish of St Michael Corn Hill, in which causes of death were recorded for a short period, contemporaneous with Grant, in the mid-17th century, but there are no ages. So these three East End parishes are all gate, closest to the city, Whitechapel and Wapping, and there are different periods in which those parish registers record causes of death. So what do those parish registers look like? I'll give you two examples here. Um, one from Aldgate in the 16th century, that's on the left-hand side as shown, and the other from uh, Whitechapel in the 18th century on the right-hand side. And uh, in the Aldgate example here, you perhaps can't make out the handwriting, but in the column on the uh, left, underneath the forename, various causes of death are given, and so are the ages. Uh, we have, for example, plague, smallpox, chrism, ague, and the rather less helpful, taken in a planet. Um, and in the, in the 18th century causes, which are a bit more clearly tabulated on a, in a column on the right-hand side with the ages in a separate uh, column, we have such things as teeth, convulsions, fever, smallpox again, consumption, surfeit, fractured skull, and so forth. Now, just in case you rush out there thinking all parish registers look like this, they do not. In fact, it's very exceptional that these causes and ages are both recorded. This is a more typical example of a parish register. This is the parish in which Grant actually died, uh, St Dunstan in the West. He died in April 1674, and his burial entry is at the bottom of the page. He was buried in the church um, out of uh, the place where he lived, which is Bolt Court, but we have no idea from this entry what he died of or at what age. So... Moving on to what we can actually do with these causes of death and ages from parish registers. Um, well, unlike the bills, as Romula has stressed, where you do get eventually an age tabulation separate from the causes, there is no cross tabulation of all age information by cause in the bills, but you can do that with this information. And here I have tabulated for these example parishes from the East End of London, uh, the composition of deaths, the causes of deaths, for infants under the age of one year. Now, Grant spent some time deducing or pondering which causes of death in the 17th century bills of mortality were probably used for young children, but he couldn't know for sure because he, that information simply wasn't available to him from the bills. He knew that they formed the bulk of all deaths, so they were very important as an overall category, but he couldn't be sure which exact causes were used. Here we can use an empirical basis, the parish registers, to examine more closely which causes were actually used for those under one year. Looking at the earlier data represented here, that from Aldgate in the uh, 16th century, you can see that certain descriptors such as chrism are used. A chrism, I should explain, is a child not long uh, from its date of baptism, so effectively a neonate, a, a a child dying in about the first month of its life. But that chrism descriptor, which is very important, apparently, in the 16th century, has disappeared by the time we reach the mid-18th century and, indeed, the early 19th century, even though there are a few instances where the child is referred to separately in the entry as a chrism. It's no longer considered to be a cause, per se. Convulsions, on the other hand, is a descriptor that is not used in the earlier data, but is extremely popular as a, a cause of death choice in the 18th century and, indeed, the early 19th century. In fact, it becomes more popular in some of the 19th century data. So that's sort of the catch-all category into which infants are placed um, from actually a fairly broad range of causes, often fevers, but other things besides. We can also see a change in some descriptors that actually do reflect a genuine change in the disease's prevalence. Uh, Romola has told us how smallpox concentrated over time in the youngest age groups. And indeed, if you look at the proportion attributed to smallpox in these uh, examples, you will see that it does rise over time. Bearing in mind that although these are separate parishes, they're very close together in the city, they're from a similarly poor population, a socially homogenous population in effect. 
There are, however, different sets of descriptors in use in different parishes. In 19th century Wapping and Whitechapel, for example, even though the parishes are adjacent and largely homogenous, teeth, which is the second largest group in Whitechapel, just isn't used in the Wapping data. And the same is true of causes of death in all age groups, not just in these infants. So this poses some problems of interpretation when we come to those overall totals that the bills give us in knowing just how certain we can be that a category really represents most or all or just some of those parishes within London. And there are great disparities in population size between those parishes. So it has implications for aggregated totals. In terms of meaning, some of these causes are best understood really as ages rather than causes of death. So I've already implied that chrism is really a child dying in about the first month of life. We shall see too that teeth is useful in this respect later. Infants is also often used in grants time, but actually not used in any of these example parishes in the descriptors that they use meaning a cause of death, but it is used in the bills. At the bottom of the table, you can see a great decrease in the supposed number of stillborns, which I shall just leave as an aside, that there is obviously some change in the way those are registered. And uh, that's not simply an artefact of the way things are aggregated in the bills. It's genuinely happening in the parish registers as well. So here we can see there's a mixture of factors that determine what changes can be observed in causes of death over times and place. places. We'll now move on to the three case studies that I mentioned at the beginning, starting with rickets. The graph shows uh, the number of burials attributed to rickets in London from the bills of mortality in the continuous blue line from the early 1630s when it first appears until uh, 1800. And you can see that there is a drastic and absolute decline in this as a cause of death descriptor to zero by 1800. Now for Grant, rickets was a new disease. It had first been mentioned in the 1629 bills of mortality, and he deduces after some comparison of other totals in the bills that it must indeed have been something new. In fact, there's a commentator from the early 18th century who also adds his uh, feeling that this was uh, something that was newly described in um, early 17th century London. We now know that rickets, rickets is caused by vitamin D deficiency, most of which we get from uh, synthesising it in the skin from sunlight. And we've heard from Richard's talk at the beginning of this morning how the use of coal had increased in London over um, the, the period before Grant wrote his observations. And also about the smoke and uh, the, the smog, effectively, that had begun to overlie the city. So we can see in Grant's remarks a possible reason why rickets might actually genuinely have appeared at this time. What is more difficult to understand is why on earth it should decline in this way, because it's, this is really quite implausible given that the city continued to grow, the use of coal certainly didn't uh, become any less over the following years, but rather greater. And in fact, from archaeological evidence analysing bones, we know that rickets was uh, actually suffered by about 15 to 20% of people throughout this early modern period. So how are we to explain why it is recorded in this way in the bills of mortality? Um, well, one thing we can do is see if it's really like that in the parishes as well. So that's represented with the red blobs here in my parish samples. And you can see that certainly in the underlying data, there really is a decrease in the number of rickets burials. It's not just some accidental artefact of the way things are aggregated. So it does look as if the searchers really weren't using rickets as a cause of death descriptor anymore. If we look at the age structure of the rickets deaths in the parish register observations, we can see that it's actually not the very youngest children who are described as dying of this descriptor, but actually slightly older children aged from 21 months to four and a half years. Now these are the group who are most likely to have had obvious visible symptoms, deformations essentially caused by rickets, as opposed to neonatal rickets cases where it might be much less obvious to casual visual inspection what was going on. So probably my hypothesis is that these children did have rickets, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean, in fact I very much doubt it does mean they were ever dying of it in the sense we would understand it now. Actually, modern studies of developing countries suggest that much higher rates of pneumonia and respiratory infections were associated with rickets. So it seems more likely that the children were actually dying of this. But what we observe is effectively an artefact of rickets going out of fashion as a cause of death descriptor. 
Happily, it's not always like that with every cause of death descriptor. If we move on to case study two on teeth, I promised you you'd know what teeth was by the end of this. Um, here's a, a box plot showing the distribution of ages for a variety of places and time periods in which teeth is used as a descriptor. The width of each box is proportional to the number of observations. Uh, the largest data set here is around the 300 mark in 18th century Whitechapel, the large red box, second along. Here I present data from both London, that's Whitechapel in red and Allgate in green, and also other urban centres. We've got Leeds in grey, a parish adjacent to Manchester in brown, and Liverpool in pink. The median age, which is the dark line bisecting each box, you can see is very consistently at the one year mark across all of these locations and time periods. There is more variation in the range of age covers, that's the height of the box, but in general, this covers the period six to 18 months. So all of those dying of teeth in whichever period we see them, and indeed in whichever location, died at a consistent point in the life cycle. Actually, if we look at modern studies of the ages at which children gain their deciduous teeth, and from archeological studies of past populations, when that may have happened, this is pretty consistent with the timing of deciduous teeth eruption. So it looks as if the searchers were, by interviewing the mothers or by observing the, the corpse, actually reporting on some visible, physical thing that they could see here, the eruption of teeth in the children. And that's why we get this nice consistent pattern of ages. But of course, the children weren't really dying of uh, gaining teeth. So what were they really dying of? Well, again, Grant comes to our aid here. He remarks that teething, convulsions and scouring, which is diarrhoea and vomiting, go hand in hand. And that conflation of those three courses gives us a bit of a clue. Now this age group being not the youngest, but from six months onwards, represents infants likely to be at the age of weaning. So they're no longer exclusively breastfed and are starting to take in other food and water, which means that they're at increased risk of infection from water and foodborne sources. The seasonality of teeth deaths indicates that there is a peak in August, in the summer months, which is exactly the same as with griping in the guts, a description that more clearly refers to diarrheal disease. However, that late summer peak in teeth in August doesn't actually continue for another month as it does with uh, griping in the guts. It doesn't continue to September, but it actually subsides and there is overall less marked seasonal variation than with griping in the guts. In fact, seasonality of the teeth desk most clearly resemble a hybrid of griping in the uh, guts and convulsions, which were probably largely brought on by fevers. So it looks as if the, these children actually died of a combination, in most cases, of diarrhoea or fevers. What we can deduce from this, though, is that because teeth defines an age band quite precisely, this could be useful when we're looking at earlier data, earlier cause of death information, where we don't have any idea of the ages um, actually being used, since there are no age structures given in the bills before 1728, in the annual bills at least. Um, then we can use this as a more precise way of guessing at deaths in particular age bands. Moving on to the third case study of old age. Again, the width of the boxes here are proportional to the number of observations. And uh, the maximum here is rather larger, about 1,250 cases in 18th century Leeds, the grey box, second along. Again, we're looking at London in comparison with other urban centres. London here, uh, there are no data from all gates, therefore it's Whitechapel in red and Wapping in blue and other areas, Leeds in grey, York in purple, and Liverpool in pink. You can immediately see from uh, the placing of the full height of the boxes, and indeed the lines representing the medians, that there is quite a lot more variation than was the case with teeth. Grant thought that old age perhaps began at 60 or 70 years of age. He makes both assertions in separate places in his observations. Perhaps he'd been influenced by his own father's death, who, as it transpires, if we believe Aubrey's biographical account, actually died at the age of 70. We know it was of old age because that cause is stated in the parish register. Um, but here, it's actually slightly older than that in most cases. It's about 75 to 85 years that are represented by this old age descriptor. Unfortunately, we don't have any earlier data 
to test whether there's actually, actually been change in time in the ages covered by the descriptor. But we can perhaps say that there is some change by place. Uh, if you look at the purple boxes representing York, it looks as if York really did seem to describe slightly older persons as suffering from old age than um, other communities. Could that be because York was slightly healthier for adults than it was in other places? Well, perhaps, but other research would have to be done. In fact, in general, there was some improvement in adult life expectancy um, by the late 18th and early 19th century. But that doesn't seem to have resulted in a general shift in the age structure of those considered old if we look across the board here. In fact, in Whitechapel, there does seem to be a shift to older persons by the early 19th century, but that's somewhat contradicted by neighbouring Wapping, where the ages in exactly the same period are quite a bit lower. So there's evidently variation between individual parishes in the way the descriptor was used. It's worth mentioning, too, that this age group, unlike teeth among the youngest, is susceptible to quite a lot of age heaping in the way the ages are reported. If you look at the number of deaths recorded as 70, 75 or 80, it's quite a large proportion of the overall totals, which doesn't help with this sort of analysis. So the use of age as a descriptor is problematic. We can also observe that its use declines over time in most cases, which we might hope would be because these people are being assigned to some more specific cause of death. In actual fact, the reverse is the case, and where the descriptor is less used, people in this age group of 70 and upwards are generally assigned to the decline or consumption causes of death. So there is no greater precision associated with the loss of the descriptor. But the few extra examples that are given with a more precise cause give some clue as to what these individuals were dying of. And we have fevers, dropsy, asthma, and so forth, giving some insights. So to conclude, what have we learned from these, sort of, these three case studies and the examination of uh, causes of death? Well, firstly, that Grant's evaluations of what these casualties mean is quite useful as an eyewitness account of what someone alive in early modern London might have imputed these things to mean, much as the searchers themselves were, with no particular medical training, making assumptions about these causes. Secondly, the bills didn't cross calculate causes uh, by age, but some parish registers allow us to do this. And from that, we can evaluate the causes of death to uh, which particular age groups' deaths were attributed. And also, now I haven't done this year, but uh, the, the, I haven't done this here, but I should say this is the basis of a wider project in, currently in progress at the Cambridge Group for the History of Population and Social Structure uh, to look at infectious diseases and the age structure of mortality in those. You've seen some of that with smallpox and romula, but you can potentially do that with other clearly identifiable infectious diseases as well. Also, we have, in point three, some reason for concern that the overall deaths reported under each cause in the bills of mortality conceal differences in the way causes are registered in different parishes that may have affected the um, trajectory of those causes over time, as we can now observe them from the bills. Some causes of death descriptors, when we look at particular examples, are more consistently applied to particular age groups than others. So teeth is a good example there whereas old age much less so. And there is variation in location or time period as well. But some descriptors simply fall out of use for no systematic reason that seems to be related to the, the, uh, the symptom no longer being regarded as important as a cause of death, as was the case with rickets and seems to have been with chrisms as well. And I shall stop there. Thank you.